Uh, my name is uh, John Methven. I went to Vietnam with the battalion, initially as a battalion commander and then as the uh, RSO, which was the regimental signals officer responsible for all uh, communications uh, throughout the battalion and air to ground and so forth. I've always had the very strong feeling that our conscription system was wrong. I don't believe that our country has the right to decide a man's life and his fate by drawing a marble out of a barrel and matching this to his birth date and saying, right, you're now two years in the army, which can include a, you know, a service uh, in a war zone. Uh, my belief is that if Australia requires the forces, then it's all in or none in. To say that, I'm not being derogative to our national servicemen. Um, they were terrific. The... Uh, you would not pick the difference between a reg and a national service by the time that by the time that national serviceman was in war, he was as good as you know you could ask. Um, but I just believe it was unfair to do that to them. Uh, and then, in a lot of cases, their time would come up before the battalion finished its tour. So suddenly they were leaving all their mates and they had this feeling of they're deserting them because their time's up and they're going back to Australia. And then when they get to Australia, it's just goodbye. You know, thanks for your service, Nick off. There's something basically wrong with that type of system. We left them by themselves you know, to fend by themselves and against a, a country that in many cases uh, was antagonistic to them. And, and this really wrecked their lives in a lot of cases. I've been a welfare and pension officer for 40, for 40 years. Um, I, I really believed that I had this obligation to do this type of thing. And, uh, yeah, it has an enormous amount. You can't take a bloke out of a civilian role and then get him to a stage where he's holding his mate while he's dying out, dying in front of him. You know, he's going through this fear of, of just trotting along and all of a sudden all hell breaks loose. And then 20 minutes later it's dead silence again except for the mop up. And, and for what you, uh, the land that you just had a massive little bit of a fight for, uh, suddenly means nothing. You get up and you walk away from it. It's not like, you know, in World War II, for example, they went, they moved, they would uh, take a village, they would hold that village, they would progress. Every stash we were in, um, it was a simple case of it was simply people against people. Uh, and then you would walk away. Both sides would just walk away and you meet in another area and go. Totally different environment and that creates stress. Uh, and they had no way of relieving it in a battalion. You didn't tell them that guy you were bloody, you know, you were suffering pretty bad or you were scared or you were this. Uh, you came back in out of beer and just said, you know, we lost Bill. What a great guy. Uh, but it, losing Bill meant something. But they kept it. They had to cover it up. Everyone had to cover it up and get on with the job. So yes, it affected them, and then add the the disbelief of what the country was doing. Not all the country, don't get me wrong, but but a majority of the people wanted to take it out on the government. Didn't know how, so they took it out on the diggers. Uh, that had a lot, and then you had the chemical issue. Uh, I mean, the first operation the battalion went on, I'd been there for nearly a month when the battalion came. And then the first operation we went was a shakeout operation and uh, we were there for a couple of days and I was, I would, we stopped for five minutes. The signal went down the line, you know, the five minute, I mean, boom. So people sat down and, and I just uh, leaned against the tree and, and I was in a small area with just a couple of guys and I felt this moisture, you know, I didn't know what it was. We'd had a plane go over and, I didn't know what it was, and then next thing I know, bloody, I'm, apparently I'm out to it. I was in a coma for three days, they're chopping me out in the works, and my whole tour from then I had to be on uh, bloody tablets and junk to stop it, and ever since I have I have to carry an EpiPen with me all the time. Uh, I'm allergic to cold, I'm allergic to perfume. My wife, I've been married for 61 years, 62 years this year, my wife's never been able to wear uh, makeup because I just break out in rashes all over the joint. It's all related. So we had this sort of chemical problem as well, and I've been pretty involved in that 
been to uh, Vietnam, met up with the Vietnamese, what they call 1080 Committee in Hanoi, which uh, is the committee that over there that examines the uh, chemical issue. And now I remember it is because in Australia we use 1080 as a rabbit killer. So I automatically assumed that that's the name they use for that 1080 committee, uh, you know, for a poison. But in fact, it's not. The Vietnamese way is, uh, you know, it was the 10th month of 1980 that they formed the committee, so a 1080 committee. <laughs> and uh, we used to, as a boy, uh, I'm 80 now, as a boy, we used to have a little bottle, I can remember, uh, that we, for blackberries, to spray blackberries. You would dilute that 100 to 1 and it would kill blackberries like, Boom. But, I mean, that was used raw in Vietnam. You're talking tons and tons of it. And they use, they mix these chemicals together and then they use that dioxin as a mixing agent. Now, dioxin is the most toxic chemical in the world. It was used as a mixing agent. And then they tell us that there was no bloody problems with spraying this garbage all over. Uh, thousands of gallons raw all over. And it was all in South Vietnam, not in North you know, and south of South Vietnam, into the, into the streams, the works. They used to argue that Australians weren't in contact with most of the spraying. Bull dust. The aircraft that they had spraying these things, if they spotted an enemy aircraft or threat, the first thing they'd do was dump the spray because the weight was such that they couldn't, you know, take off quick. So they would bloody dump the spray and head for home. Wouldn't matter where it was. Nearly a quarter of everything they sprayed was dumped for various reasons. Uh, yeah, so that's been a problem I've been involved with. I was national president for three years and um, during that period I, I was pleased that we finally got the government to do a health survey of veterans and uh, that took a lot of bloody going. And we got it uh, in the end. I gave a guarantee that if, if the study showed that there were no Effect that any known cancer or, or incident um, didn't show up uh, as above the average, then we would shut our mouth and get on with just looking after our guys. Well, it, the end study uh, had two interesting things. First of all, it was the highest self reporting study that the government had ever run. They sent a letter to every Vietnam vet with this survey. And the highest percentage ever. So it shows you how much they were concerned about. And secondly, the results came back strongly. There were a number of cancers that we have. We are way above the uh, accepted incident rate and so forth. Uh, but they still won't accept it. America accepts it now. New Zealand accepts it. Our government, no. They have, uh, they have a... Uh, system in America and New Zealand now that says that if you were in Vietnam, then it is assumed that you were in contact with chemicals. So when you put a claim in, you don't have to go through all that rigmarole. In Australia, no, every individual has to try to prove, even today, that he was in a particular spot at a particular time and that time must be matched with a spray. You know, farcical, absolutely farcical. The interesting thing is, I mean, now a police, our ambulance and everything, they all have these sort of circumstances that, that eventually take a toll on them. And uh, many of them do suffer from P what's known as PTSD now. And there's a medical criteria that sets exactly what you've got to go through to, to actually get PTSD, not stress. Um, and, and I've got no doubts that they do. The difference being that in, uh, in a war, the incident happens, but within an hour you're back, you've got to operate normal and, and you spend the next months, you don't tell anyone you're in this. Whereas nowadays we've learned if an incident happens with a police or ambulance or whatever, there is immediate assistance to debrief, to go through all this and help them. And that doesn't happen with the military. They, they're stuck on it. Um, and so you get that. And the other thing is that it might stay dormant for quite a while. I honestly uh, had absolutely no, you know, I was sure I had absolutely nothing in the way of PTSD or anything until years later, and in fact it was 1970, 
74, 75 or something. No, it was later than that. It must have been about 82, something like that. I'd been involved for some reason, maybe because of my training, where there'd been a car accident and so forth. I'd had three or four instances where I was on the spot and helped people in the works. And then I was sitting in a car in Moorabak or, or driving in a car and the car in front of me McGinn, had an accident with a kid coming down a hill on his push bike and boom, it hit that. And I, I immediately out of the car and I helped the kid and I got back in the car and I was just, my hands were going like nothing and I thought mentally I suddenly said, I can't do that again. I can never do that again. And within a couple of weeks I started to really go clunk, clunk, clunk and, and I really hit the wall. I, I spent, uh, I suffered very badly from uh, PTSD, from panic attacks, took over me for two years. Uh, I would have 10 to 15 panic attacks a day. Couldn't get in a car and drive. Uh, I couldn't bloody get on a public train. I had to go to Melbourne for a meeting uh, one time and after the meeting I had to get out at every station all the way to Little Girl. I just couldn't stand in it. You know, people around me and all that. And, and I just fell right apart. And it took me a few years to gradually overcome that. So there are a lot of effects from war. In World War I and World War II, they shoved my way in a bloody uh, in a sanitarium. And so they gone nuts, silly buggers, lock them away. What a, you know, yeah. my God, what did we do to these people? Yeah. Hell shot. Yeah. 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 Very sad. They shall not grow old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them.